everyone for joining. Uh, we're going to start our next uh, CM Builder user workshop. Today, we're going to focus on the latest and greatest features that we recently released and how you're going to apply them into your projects. Right. So a quick round of introductions over here. My name is Pedro Souza. I'm the customer success manager for CM Builder. I have over here in the call with me, uh, Jay. He is our customer, uh, customer success specialist. He's going to be handling the first part of this session. And then uh, we also have have Will. Um, it, it, he is our technical um, artist. He is going to be doing the second part of the session. And Jay, if you change it to the agenda, I'm just going to explain a little bit about the things that we're going to talk about today. So the first part of it, uh, the first item is our new project creation. We, which is uh, something that we just rolled out, and uh, you will be able to create projects with more accuracy in terms of your terrain, select things uh, faster and better. Then we're going to move on to the new features that we re uh, release related to the milestone manager and how you're going to be able to manage your milestones using the table view. The third part is about the advanced sketch tool functionality. There's something that a lot of people requested, how you to use uh, snapping functionalities to create better polylines and things related to that. Then we're going to move on to the multiplayer view mode. We're going to touch base on other um, new um, items as well, like in between. And then uh, we will take over and talk about the visual graph animation, which is basically using a visual coding system to create animation for resources. And then I'll finish up with some items from our roadmap and open space for a Q&A, right? So um, thanks a lot for everyone for joining. So let's start right away. Jay, go ahead, my friend. No worries. Thanks, Pedro. Welcome to all our amazing users. Uh, as Pedro mentioned, uh, I'm Jay, a customer success specialist here at CM Builder. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, we have plenty of new features to uh, share with you today that I'm excited to share um, and some big new improvements uh, in usability and workflow. So, uh, so some of these new features aren't even enabled by default in the product just yet. Um, however, we're getting, giving all our users access to these new features to test for yourself. Um, so I'm going to show you how you can enable those and then uh, you can give us feedback. Tell us what you like and what you don't like and help us build the product you want to see. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Let's jump in because we've got plenty to get through. So if I just from the projects page go to uh, user preferences. So that is available under the user icon here, user preferences. And if I scroll down to experimental features, I'm going to see all these new features we have available for you to test. So uh, as Pedro mentioned there in the agenda, uh, we're going to go through all of these today. So I'm just going to toggle all of those on, including the new project setup. So that's what I'm going to talk about now. So once I've toggled those on, I'm going to confirm that. OK, so right away, I'm going to create a new project and the new project flow is already enabled. So uh, as always, we start with the project name. I'm just going to call it workshop uh, for, for our case today. And I can immediately upload a thumbnail for my project that's going to appear on the project tile. So next, set up 3D map. So as always, um, we just have to start with uh, an address or a location, and you can immediately see that the UI has completely changed. Uh, so let's start with an address. Pedro, can you uh, can you give me somewhere in the world you'd love to navigate to? Uh, let's go to my hometown, Salvador, in Brazil. Let's see what what those people up there are doing. <laughs> going on. This is uh, humble beginnings of our uh, resident rock star. So Salvador, Brazil. Here we are. So you can see it will navigate the globe and uh, bring you to your site address. So you can see this square here. That's actually a preview of the size of the map. So to uh, select which, uh, like to define the size of the map, sorry, you have four predefined map tile sizes. You can see them here by clicking and you'll get the preview. Um, based on the, the size, and you can also uh, adjust to a custom size. So I can either drag the handles out here like this, or I can enter uh, a value here. So let's just say a round number like 1,000. So um, you can now adjust that from 100 to 5,000 meters squared. So that's much larger than you're ever able to before. 
You can also fine tune the location of the map. So if I use the pan function, so if I hold the right click and drag, I can sort of just fine tune exactly where my project will be. So say it's uh, the football stadium or say it's over here and I want to include the football stadium, I can just move it there and expand the bounds of the project just like that. I'm getting an error here. It's just telling me that the center of the map the project origin and the address that I selected from the search is not aligned. So I can align those there by setting new address. Okay, so once I'm happy with that, I'll just say, I'll just use a predefined, I'm gonna uh, generate 3D map. I will just mention though as well, uh, we've had some, some graphic updates on the map and satellite view mode. So you can see it's a uh, higher resolution, it's clear it's, and it's a lot clearer. So uh, that's, that's something you'll notice as well. Um, however, I'm gonna use the map view mode. So let's go to the next part, generate 3D map. So as before, you now have the option, you uh, now have the ability to see the uh, topography, but you now have a, a, a direct preview of what you're going to create, uh, whereas you had to create the scenario first before. So um, I can generate, I can pick from a topographic or a flat map view. And with this sea level indicator, I can see what uh, the elevation here is at different points. So that's really great. So <clears throat> uh, I can also adjust the map thickness. So if you have a particularly deep excavation, you're, uh, you're excavating your doomsday bunker or something, you can uh, extend that map tile thickness as far as you need. So I'm just gonna use the default, but that's uh, also a cool new feature. That, uh, that we have available. Uh, the only other thing to mention with the flat map is uh, given by default, it's zero everywhere, you can manually adjust that. So say I wanted it as 100 meters sea level, if I now use my sea level indicator, everywhere on that map is 100 meters sea level. Okay, so that's uh, all I need to do there. And I'm gonna apply and create scenario. So I no longer have to go to the preview and then create a scenario. It's all one, uh, one flow now. So now I've created my scenario there and I'm ready to create my project. So that's the new project creation flow. Um, and again, if, if you have any questions at any time, feel free to drop them in the Teams chat. Uh, we can uh, answer them as we go. And then if there's any residual questions, we'll answer them at the end. So I've actually uh, already created a project here that I'm gonna use for the workshop. So this is uh, downtown Chicago, and uh, this is my site that I've picked out. <clears throat> and so the talking about, so once I've created my, my, uh, my map and generated my project, the first thing we need to consider our project inputs. So those are our uh, milestones, our models and drawings. So those are the three external inputs we consider when, when creating a project. The most important being your milestones. So they are uh, what represent your schedule. So we actually need uh, the project milestones or tasks to create create sequence. So I've gone ahead and already created a number of milestones using the import schedule. Uh, you can see when I first create a project, we create this one default milestone project start. That will be that will represent uh, today's date usually. So. Um, we have some new functioning, functionality around the milestone manager that I want to explore with you. First of all, um, to edit the milestones, if you didn't already know, it's, it's pretty simple. The old functionality is you just uh, double click to enter, sorry, to edit the name and address, uh, name and date, sorry. And then you can easily click the plus icon to create a new milestone or uh, delete it there. And then, so if I click the three dots, I can actually change uh, my index view. So I can change from weekly to monthly to index. So uh, I can easily change that index. So the consequence of this as well is when you create a new milestone, uh, if my index is weekly, I'm gonna increment by a week and monthly, I'm gonna increment by a month and index that's a uh, custom, uh, a custom uh, index, I suppose, so a custom increment. Uh, okay, so uh, just one, one note about that uh, yep. is that the, the default uh, the default increment 
so you can still edit the, the, the dates of the milestone once you create them. And the second thing that I want to also uh, chime in is that you can control that that uh, view of the time unit from your unit settings from your user settings over there clicking on your name right so that will apply uh, as a is a milestone display reference for all the projects that you as a user are looking at because um in the other one when you change there is like a temporary setting that will be applied for the scenario they're working on at the moment okay Thanks, Pedro. Yeah, so uh, what I want to talk about now is this new feature, Milestone Manager. So you can actually view all your milestones in a table view mode. So it's it's much easier to visually see uh, your schedule. As I said, I've already uploaded a schedule to use for this project. Um, I'm currently on project start, and the current milestone is indicated by the blue dot here. It's also easier than ever to navigate to different milestones, especially if you have you know, tens of milestones, it can be quite tedious to have to click through them. So now if you just go to this go to milestone option, I'm going to immediately navigate to that milestone. So and then as I mentioned, this blue dot is my current milestone. So uh, I can now edit them from here so I can easily double click to change the name or date and I can create new ones quite simply by clicking the three dots here. So I can add a new milestone. So say, well, let's say uh, you've, you've generated your uh, your schedule, your, your milestones from your uh, schedule. However, you, you forgot a few milestones. So let's say you wanted to add a new uh, milestone, but needed to put it in between two existing ones. So say I come here and I want to add a new milestone. So I can have the option here under this drop down to add before or add after. So in this case, I'm going to add after. And <clears throat> what's going to happen here based on these two dates is it's going to divide the delta by two. So this is the, the middle date of these two. So it's going to sit there. So let's say, uh, you know, level one waterproofing, something like that. If I could, uh, if I could spell. So there we go. So it's as simple as that to create new milestones in between existing ones. So I may as well go ahead and show you again. So just go here, click there, add after. I'm going to create one there and L to waterproofing. So you can easily adjust your schedule as you need from the table view. OK, so that is the uh, new milestone manager. Uh, so one thing to mention as well, uh, on export, you can actually, so if these dates weren't final, you can actually hide these dates. So if I if I go share, uh, generate link, I can hide the milestone dates and so that you can just see the milestone index and the name, something to be aware of. Okay, uh, so now I've got my milestones all set up. Uh, I'm going to do some uh, project setup and show you the new sketch functionality. <clears throat> So um, from site mobilization, I'm going to create a fence. So resources, logistics, fencing, pick which fence I like. OK, so uh, checking that you're on polyline, um, I'm sketching on a Z plane instead of just the terrain. And there's going to be a number of settings that appear here that I'm going to explain to you. So I'm just going to start sketching. So immediately you can see uh, it's completely different from the old sketch functionality. Uh, or the old sketch tool, I'm now sketching on this grid surface. And if I go to settings, uh, I've got a number of display options here. So you can see I'm displaying the length and angle bubble here. So as I adjust my, my angle, you're gonna see that change. So those, uh, you can toggle these on. If I click uh, this next line here, I'm gonna get an area preview of if I was to close that polygon there, uh, this snapping, so that's actually what appears when this red dotted line comes up. So here I'm actually drawing parallel to the grid. And say so if I come out here, it's going to project to that uh, adjacent point there. So that snapping functionality can be super handy uh, with sketching. Lastly, we have uh, 3D projection and guiding lines. So this is uh, something, so when you, uh, I've mentioned that we're sketching on the Z plane. Uh, so you can actually change the uh, elevation of that plane. 
and then you can project the sketch down onto the terrain or onto the map tile. So that uh, I'm actually just sketching on the map here pretty much, so you, you can't see the projection, but uh, that is something you can uh, enable as well. And finally, this closed polyline automatically. So if I was to click just uh, you know these three lines and enable this mode, then that's going to and hit confirm. It's going to close the polygon automatically, just like that. Uh, so there are a number of geometric constraints with with the sketch tool now. Uh, so I can snap to uh, a, like another line or another object. So if I go snap to face, if I just click the line of my sketch and then some surface, it's going to snap there to that surface. So that's uh, quite useful there. So and then we just click off to confirm, but I'm going to move it back because I don't want my fence over there. Uh, another useful thing you might want to use is perpendicular. So again, clicking these two lines, oh, sorry, perpendicular, then clicking one line and then the second and clicking off to confirm. You can see there it's uh, in the 90 degree angle and so on for parallel and equal length. I'm not going to show those there now just because it's a square. So um, <clears throat> once I'm happy with my sketch, I can confirm that. Okay, so one thing to note here now is this propagation mode. So this is actually uh, the uh, plane that the sketch is going to follow. So uh, at the moment, it's following my sketch plane, which uh, is a flat surface close to the map tile at the moment. So I could adjust, as I mentioned, that Z plane to be at any elevation of my choosing. Um, however, because it's a fence, I actually want it to snap to the terrain. So I'm going to use the follow terrain option for my fence. So once I'm happy with that, I'm going to click done. Uh, so there's my fence. And so this, as we enabled from user preferences, uh, this is now available for excavation. So I'm going to go forth and show you how you can do this with your excavation as well. So uh, the snap to face tool in particular is going to be super helpful. So uh, I'm going to open my excavation tool now. Uh, and I'm on milestone three. And I'm going to use my model as a reference here. So I can see that my model is underneath the surface here. So I've already uploaded this before, the, uh, uh, before we started, just so I could, uh, for expedience here. So I'm going to create a cut. And if I click that model there, I can use it as a reference. And I'm just going to quickly draw my. Uh, sorry, one moment. I just had to check that I enabled that. I didn't. Sorry about that. OK, there we go. OK. Apologies there, I hadn't had it enabled on this one. So, uh, yep, so moving forward, I'm going to use uh, my model using the 2D view to sketch around. So I can create. So while you do that, I just want to also mention that with this new sketching tool, like right now, one thing that you can do with um, objects like a fence, like the one that he just drew, is that after the fence is done, you can also double click on that fence and expose those moving handles so you can move it around, right? So you don't need to redraw the fence to position it somewhere else. You can simply move the whole thing at once. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sorry, yeah, I will show you that. There's, um, I'm going to show you that functionality further uh, as well, being with the ability to draw on uh, objects and buildings. So what I'm doing here now is using the snap to face and using my model to do that. So I'm just clicking the snap to face, clicking the line, and then uh, clicking the uh, face of my pad footings here. So that's uh, helping me to constrain my sketch here, just like that. So I'm just going to speed this up a little bit. So what I did here as well was hide the excavation so that I can see the model clearly. Okay, 
Yeah, another note about that is that hiding and excavation and hiding the terrain are two different things, right? So the excavation, he hid it from the three, the, from the tree, right? So you go into site planning, you see that excavation item over there and you hide it. You're hiding the excavation boundary when you do that. If you want to hide the, the whole terrain, you can do it from settings, right? Because once you click, create an excavation, the boundary that shows up is that item over there on the tree structure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, so now I've got, I've defined my cut. I just need to define my depth as always. So <clears throat> I can type a value in here, but now I also have these handles so I can change the cut depth and you can see it change immediately, which is great. Um, however, I'm just gonna enter a value as one meter and I can also slope the walls of my cut here as before and say I want to I don't know I can differentiate which walls I want to slope so say I deselect that one for example and then once I'm happy uh, with my cut I can click done and there I have my cut uh, bound by my model um, so those new sketch constraints can be can be very useful so I'm going to make uh, one more cut here and I'm going to use my model again quickly. Um, sorry, I'm going to click my foundation here. And I'm actually going to snap this next cut to my initial cut. So I'm just creating a rough sketch there using the uh, constraints again. So I'm going to click this line and surface. So now I've snapped those two cuts together just like that. And I might just extend it in case uh, there's any leftover material. Okay, so I can confirm that now. And we'll also have that as one meter, sloping the walls and hit done there. So there's my cuts. Okay. All right, uh, so now I can go ahead and uh, put in some, some resources uh, or anything like that. Um, so I have a bit of a sequence here already. So you can see my, my building coming up. One thing I want to show with the resources is, uh, I'm going to put it here now, is the new drop to terrain functionality. So say I put in uh, an excavator. Yep. Okay, so say I put an excavator here and I put that into here. Okay, so when I click to my next milestone now, based on that, uh, the timeline of this, this resource, it's still, uh, its position has still not changed. So it's still preserving that position from the first milestone. So what I can do now, given that the uh, terrain underneath it has changed, is I can right click the resource and then click drop to surface. So uh, now when I click between the milestones, it automatically drops to the terrain there, which is great. So that's also available under here, reposition, drop to surface. So that's a good thing to be aware of. Okay, uh, finally, I wanted to show um, the sketch functionality with being able to draw on surfaces and buildings. So let's say I come to here, for example, and I want to draw some edge protection. So from my resources, um, let's type in edge. This guy will do. And I'm going to use the polyline sketch. And let's just say just quickly, I'm just going to draw a portion of it. I'm actually going to turn off my snapping just so I can draw freely. Also interesting to be on 2D for this. Yeah. And so you selecting the right points. Yeah. Sorry, I was a little bit off the sketch there. So 2D, that's a good, a good note. Thanks, Pedro. So say, I'm going to draw my edge protection here. So I'm just going to, I'm not going to draw the full thing, but say something like that. And I'm just going to make sure that closed polyline is off. Okay. So I'm going to confirm that now. I'm also going to check that I'm on sketch Z plane. Uh, yep. Uh, so continue. 
Okay, so now if I go to 3D, I can see by default my sketch plane is snapping to the map, but I want to sketch on the building, so I simply change this plane offset and it's going to move that entire plane. So if I know the value of the height of the building, I can simply enter it there, but even easier, I can select the offset from the 3D viewer, so that's 11.27 meters, and now that plane is on the elevation of the top of the building. So you can see the grid is now at that elevation if I move through it there. So if I hit confirm, oh, I just have to click now from propagation, follow plane. Uh, just that's a good note. So remember to click follow plane, otherwise it's following the map. It's now going to snap to the building. So there's my edge protection. So that's a huge uh, feature improvement. We've had we've had a lot of feedback from users that you know, you want to be able to draw uh, on buildings for a while now. So um, that's going to be super useful. Uh, OK, so one last feature I want to talk about um, is the ability to uh, change the color of model elements. So say, so you can see these slabs are split into three sections. So say you wanted to, uh, I don't know, demonstrate the sequence. I uh, sorry, call out the sequence in your presentation. I can simply go here, uh, click right click the element, then edit model element. I have this option to change the color here. So uh, let's say we go red for this one. And let's carry forth and blue for this one. And model element. I don't know. Uh, green for this one. OK, so there I can easily uh, edit the colors of my model. So uh, you can call out certain sections in your presentation and uh, you know we're you know it's one step closer to uh, model editing so yeah uh, okay so uh, I noticed now as well uh, Pedro is in the scenario with me so one of those new features that we enabled was multiplayer view mode so Pedro is actually watching uh, what I do uh, as I as I make changes to this site with this multiplayer view mode so uh, if I'm actually going to give Pedro access so you can see what, what he sees. So uh, if I jump out of the scenario and I click, I simply just need to click onto Pedro's name. Oh, Pedro disappeared. There we go. He's back. back. I was just going in and refreshing my scene so it could be editing as well. Okay, so cool. let's yeah, say that so I'm going to play the part. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Jay. Yeah, sorry, sorry. I just have to click the the uh, his name there to observe what he's what he's doing. So now I'm observing Pedro's uh, actions. Sorry, go ahead, Pedro. No, I'm just like showing that this could be a use case of like a team working together, where like you have a person that's like working on the sequencing, and then a person would jump in and say like, hey, now it's the time that I would do some traffic control over here, right? So I'm in charge of understanding how these environments uh, would be for the traffic control. I can simply put in like a narrow over there and you're seeing, you're not seeing my screen, you're seeing uh, Jay's screen following my, my actions, right? So I could mm -hmm. start placing some things around and confirm once i confirm it will show up in his in his view right so this right now is more like a viewing um it's um kind of capability he's observing what i'm doing but uh the next step would be that both of us will be able to edit together right so it's like just one step further and we will be able to edit and collaborate on the site at the same time so yeah it's a very interesting tool to enhance that collaboration with like different teams different people working on the same on the same project cool yeah nice um, I think that that's it for uh, Jay's scope, right? So um, mm -hmm. if you have any questions, please drop them on the QA over here. Uh, we will be happy to answer while we move to the next step where it Will is going to uh, present the part of the, about the visual graphs. Okay, Will, this is your cue. Go ahead, man. Thanks, Pedro. Oh. So I'm just going to start out by loading up our map here. Uh, this is a little bit smaller than Chicago. This is Brandon, Manitoba. It's where my wife is from. And if we just load this scenario up. 
we can see an example of some dynamic animations that have been com uh, created completely inside of Builder um, and are fully reusable, modular, and add sort of a dynamic presence to any of your scenes. Um, it's no secret that, uh, that our customers are bursting with creativity. And what we're looking to do is give them an expressive outlet uh, to convey not just visual flair, but meaningful storytelling um, and precise chains of, of information. Uh, so take a step back for a second here. Uh, what is what is a logic graph and how can we use it to increase uh, for storytelling and increased wow factor? So visual programming is essentially a no code solution for being able to build complex uh, software solutions or chains of logic without actually having to know any programming. Uh, it has a quite a storied history uh, alongside traditional software development. A lot of early command and control systems use node based logic because it's very easy to see the flow of, of events that are currently happening. Uh, on the right, we see an example of Grasshopper who uses it for parametric modeling. Sorry, I need to start the slideshow here and at the bottom we see uh, an example from epic's unreal engine which allows you to create uh, completely fully finished triple a commercial games and interactive experiences using just a no code uh, node based logic environment um, so there's a lot of uh, different use uh, use cases for a, re a logic graph uh, there's a b testing there's interactivity there is, like I said, storytelling and visual appeal. Um, but specifically, what we're going to talk about today is using the, the logic graph to animate our parametric resource system. We have a huge selection of parametric resources inside of Builder, uh, and many of those uh, are, contain quite complex controls uh, to set up. And what we want to do is harness the data that we've already accumulated building these and allow our customers to have easy access to manipulate and present that data uh, to augment their storytelling and our interactive experiences. So if we look at uh, this example of an excavator, we have our traditional our parametric handles that control rotation. Um, but if we look a little bit under the hood, we can see that these handles are actually controlled by what are called bones. Um, bones uh, operate in a hierarchy, similar to if you think of a person's skeleton, uh, that tells each bone what, uh, what bones above it in the hierarchy influence it and what bones below it it influences. So these are used to determine our rotation and length handles for our parametric resources. If you think about animating, you can basically break it down, and especially when we get into mechanical animating, which is what we're dealing with here, we can basically break it down into a finite series of discrete steps, right? So if we look at this example, where our first step is the approach of the excavator, our second step is a clockwise 90 degree turn, our third step is the upper arm motion, and the fourth step is an adjustment of the bucket. Using the same ethos, we can build a very easy to use and easy to understand animation system that correlates basically one to one. So that one node, it represents one step in your animation chain. Now you can mix and match these, run them in parallel, but the basis of it is one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So if we take a look at what that looks like now, let's just go over to this guy here. And this is one that I just started setting up a little bit. So if we go here and open up the side sheet and use the more drop down, we have this visual graph option right here. And if we click this, we're going to get a condensed version of our visual graph. Now, every resource is automatically loaded up with a visual graph as long as you tick off the experimental setting in the user preferences. Uh, so if we, what we can do, because this isn't really the best viewport for building your graphs, we can hit this button down here and expand this out. So if we look, for example, at this, uh, at this basic setup, we have uh, what's called, uh, uh, we have a debug button. And what this allows you to do is essentially manually execute the logic for your nodes instead of having to trigger from an event. Um, but we have a variety of events available as well. 
Uh, if we right click and we go to add node here and then to events, we can see we have all different types of events that can kick off uh, your, your logic. So there's the scenario start event, which the rest of the, the other excavators in this scene have been set to so that their animations start as soon as you load your scenario. We have a milestone change event, which triggers uh, events when the milestone changes. And you can set that up to trigger specific animations or specific chains of events on a specific milestone as well. Um, and then other many other types of events. But for debugging and building graphs, it's very handy to just have a, a button that you can click and test out. Uh, so anyways, if we go ahead and click this button, we get some movement. And if we go back here and check this out, we see that we're moving our base position here being zero. We are moving 30 meters forward over a duration of five seconds. So if we were to go and change this, for example, to two seconds and then play it again, we see we can easily modify the speed. Going a step farther than that, we can actually uh, once again, either going into our right click menu or you can double click and we have an, a search as well. But uh, if we go into just use the search here, we search slider. We have the option of an internal slider. And so what this does is it actually creates a. Creates a prepackaged parameter slider here on your side sheet so that somebody could load this resource in, not know anything about visual programming, and be able to change the slider to tweak specific parameters that you designate inside of your node graph. So right now, we're, we've got this hard-coded. Our duration of the trip is, is two seconds. But if we were to change this to a slider, let's get rid of that. Again. You can also name your sliders. So if we were to name this speed, for example, and then go back here. You can see that simply by modifying, really we should have called this duration because the higher you, the higher you turn it up, the slower it goes technically. But you can see we can easily modify resources. So let's let's add an actual animation onto this guy. So we've we've split this out quite a bit just to show you kind of how how the animation system works. But there are easier ways to accomplish animation. We go to the add node and then animation here. We have an animate bone option. And what the animate bone option allows you to do is it's a self-contained node where we basically provide it our output of bones. And so this this handy node right here is kind of our master node. Each resource, when it's created, is spawned with a master node, which provides an output of all of the properties and information about the particular resource graph that we're in right now. So if we go and hook up that animate bone node and then drop this down, we now have access to all of the bones that are attached to parametric handles. So if we go back and we look at this, go to adjust, we can see that each one of these handles corresponds to an option in this drop down. So we take, for example, the cabin rotation. And so we want to go from zero. We're going to go 180 degrees and we're going to do it over five seconds. And so when do we want this to trigger? Um, based on our previous action of the excavator moving into position, we could trigger it when it starts moving, while it's moving, or when it's finished moving. So in this case, we're going to trigger it when it's finished moving. And if we try this again now, we see we've got our result. We're still moving quite fast, so we're probably going to want to turn that duration back down by the end, too. And let's say we want to make another one. Let's turn it, let's put it back into its original position now. If we just wire this up, the finished node to the trigger node, this ensures that once the original 180 degree action is completed, the second this action will fire after. And we're going to go from 180 to zero. And let's make this one take three seconds instead. 
And so what you're going to notice is the first time you fire this, it will still have the 180 rotation on it. But now that we're resetting back to our default values, every time we subsequently loop this, we'll be starting with correct values. And so then we can take this, we can turn the duration up, and we can turn the duration down. But guarantee our chain of events, regardless of changing different parameters. Uh, we could create additional sliders uh, for the start and end positions of the rotation. Uh, so there's really no limit on uh, on what you can do with this. Uh, last thing, let's say that we wanted this to, to loop, for example. Um, if we go into under the logic graph here, is how do you open sorry, that? Sorry. How do you open that um, the finder, like the search? This so for the search, you double left click, double and left then click. for the menu, right click, add node. Sorry, there's two nodes. One's called sequence, and one's called sequencer. So it got me kind of tripped up there for a second. Anyways, so what the sequencer node does is it allows you to. So we'll take the finished uh, action here, and we will feed it into the sequencer, and then we'll take this and feed it into the very first node after the button that kicks off the animation. So what we've done now is we've created a cycle, right? This is going to go around in a loop, but we have nothing to actually kick off this cycle. So we could use um, we could use an on scenario start, in which case a scenario start will kick this off and then it will cycle after that. Or we can also plug in our debug button. And if we click it this time, this should now be on an infinite loop. We'll see it return to its original position after. And there we go. So we're really excited. The most uh, in incredible innovation so far with the resource logic graph have come from people who are just being exposed to it for the first time. We're, we're very excited for, for what you guys are going to come up with. Uh, and yeah, I, I, I'm very excited for the future of the Logic Graph and Builder. So with that, I'm going to pass it back to you, Pedro. Oh yeah, thank you. I this is amazing. I love that. Like that, those animations are super cool, and I'm also very excited to know what people will come <laughs> come on with it. Uh, okay, I'm going to move on to the questions in the Q&A right now. So let me open this side sheet over here. I have a bunch of stuff that I want to, to, to share. Like, so the first question was from, um, can you align the sketch grid to imported models? Okay, so the sketch grid, uh, so let me open a site over here that, um, just like the same site that um, that Jay was showing over there. Uh, doo -doo -doo. So the user workshop site over here. So you, the sketch of the sketch grid that uh, over here in the question is basically the sketch grid for the whenever you join the sketch that grid that shows up in there, right? So that will come once we uh, we release the project north definition um, on the project setup. So this is why um, this is going to be assigned whenever you're creating your project setup. You're going to define the main orientation for that site and um, the project, the grid will follow follow that main orientation. So basically, this grid over here, you see that there is like a vertical and a horizontal um, main direction over here. You will be able to change that to have it like following a specific project north, right? So this is not yet uh, released, but it's in our roadmap, and we're going to work this on this uh, soon. Second question over here oh, is, Pedro, whoop, go just ahead. Just one second. I just, just want to share. Thing here because I think we're going to be sharing the JSON for it, like this, the save for this excavator file, right? Um, yeah. So I just wanted to show real quick uh, how you would export and import these guys. So if I double click on this guy here, 
and we go to the visual graph. I apologize, I'm just getting a couple questions about it, so I wanted to make sure that I covered it. Um, if we hit the export button here, you're going to see it trigger a download right there. And if you let's go over here, if we go to resources and equipment up here, we have this import templates button. So what you can do is select the file. This can be in a completely different project or scenario, right? And we can click on that. And there we've got our entire graph reloaded, ready to go. Yeah. So I think we're going to be sharing that is, is just why I wanted to cover this, because people aren't going to know what to do with it otherwise. Yeah, exactly. It's good to have those examples as well, because then you can visualize what can be done and like understand what is a template for that. So you can apply that the same logic to different resources. Exactly. Right? And you can that. clone this. For example, you could clone this, say paste it, and now you have a completely separate one. So you could tweak this, mess it up, break it. And this guy is still pristine and you've still got your save file to to play with as well. So you're you can always keep wherever your progress is and work. So that's all for me. Oh, <laughs> no problem. Um another question over here is that if we can oh override the color of model elements linked to milestones, right? So this is something that we don't have yet, but we plan on working on that as well. Uh, Shane already uh, contacted the person that asked over here. We're probably going to get in touch to understand more about uh, like the details of what you want. So we can uh, create something that's more targeted to your use case. Um, OK, and yeah, so also, one question over here is: uh, Can we can visual graphs be saved and reused on different projects? We'll just <laughs> show how to do that. Uh, it's very straightforward. You can simply create your own templates and go ahead with that. Okay. Um, okay. I think that's it for Q and A. I'll just maybe like wait for a couple minutes more to see if anyone wants to ask ask any question. And uh, we can maybe call it a day, wrap it up. <laughs> OK. That, that concludes all our questions. Mm -hmm. okay. No one else, any other questions? You have this for a few more minutes. Cool. Doesn't have to be related to what we showed today. Yeah, while we have that, I'm just going to go ahead and keep creating some stuff over here. So maybe. Uh, I don't have any that, uh, that I, I didn't quite show is uh, when you sketch on the Z plane, you can actually adjust that with the handle. Would you mind showing that quickly? Yeah, sure. Uh, so let me go to the stage where you created that um, this part over here. So I can whenever I double click this, I can just move it up and down as as I need to. Right. So that's what you meant. That's exactly what I meant. Yeah. Yep. So that's exactly. the first time we've been able to, yeah, uh, mm -hmm. move polyline resources uh, using the movement handles. So it's a huge, yeah. you huge, can huge do, improvement. Can you do the same thing like sideways as well? So like if you mm -hmm. want to quickly adjust that, and so on and so forth. Yep. And yeah, we just you just have to make sure you're on the po follow plane uh, propagation because mm -hmm. you're actually moving the plane. There. Yeah. So okay. like the difference between these three, just before we, we wrap it up, uh, I want to just show like one thing over here. So I'm going to quick, I'm going to create a, a bigger X. Actually, I'm going to go back to the excavation step over here, this one. So I'm going to create one fence just to make sure that everybody understands this part over here. So I'm going to create one fence that's going to have a point that is over here in a point that is over here, right? So these two points have different elevations, right? So the first propagation mode means that all each one of these panels will try to follow the terrain and be placed on the terrain, right? So you will get there and be placed over there. A straight line means that between this point and this point, there is a line and we're gonna propagate the panels using that line. So it's gonna be uh, 
going to follow that line. And the second one, the follow plane, it means that this point and this point, whatever they are in that Z elevation plane, we that's what's going to propagate, right? So because our sketch is actually on the bottom of excavation over here, you see that because of this, the follow plane is actually following that and I can move this up and down now. There's a lot of stuff that can be done with this new feature. So um, if you guys have any questions, please, uh, please let us know. OK, okay yeah. um, so I think that that's a wrap. Um, and thank you all for coming. It was amazing. I'm so excited about the, the, the things that you guys are going to come up with the animation part of it, but also um, let us know if you have any questions. OK, thank you all. See you then. Thank you very much. See you later.